with this chapter, we've got two kind of fancy words that when you looked at them, you probably said, well, I don't know what these things mean. And you saw orthodoxy, and what did you think? Probably first, right off the bat, Eastern Orthodoxy. Because, right, because we talked about the Eastern Orthodox <coughs> Church. Neo-Orthodoxy is not connected with Eastern Orthodoxy as well. As you read on, you realized it had to do with Protestants. And then we're going to look at ecumenicism. Um, this is a word you might have heard, depending on you know, what sort of religious background you've had. Um, or if you, if you go to inter-church dialogues or interfaith dialogues, that's an example of ecumenicism. So that became something uh, popular. That became something important in the last you know, half century or so. So let's talk about neo-orthodoxy first. A little bit of review. We, we've talked in previous chapters about the rise of Christian fundamentalism. And fundamentalists counterpose themselves to modernists, who would usually not call themselves modernists, but liberals, or talk in terms of the social gospel. What were the real dividing issues um, that broke up churches? Because remember, the fundamentalists and the modernists, they, they had these battles within churches over who would actually control things. Um, one of the big issues is evolution. The, the theory of, of evolution coming down from Darwin, that said that human beings, uh, well, there were really a few different factors. One was, you know, could the biblical creation story be literally true if evolution is true? You have to pick one or the other, right? Even if you say, well, God started evolution, God would have had to have started evolution a long, long ways back. Um, the other thing that they were really worried about was social Darwinism. This notion that it was survival of the fittest and, you know, that's not really compatible with the, the Christian worldview or message or, or, or social ethic. Biblical scholarship, um, critical scholarship had begun to show that these texts of the Bible did not come down, you know, verbatim from some mouth in the cloud saying, write this down, but rather they had gone through processes of editing they were conditioned by the cultures of the time. Um, they were written at different times. Si you know, single books might actually have a couple different people writing, <coughs> bless you, writing and, and incorporating things over the, the course of time, um, like the book of Isaiah, for example. Some books actually, you know that they had to have been written by different people, like the Psalms, because it'll say, Psalm of David, Psalm of Solomon, Psalm of this guy. But, you know, a lot of people had the view that the Bible was just like one big book that came directly from, from God himself. And, you know, saying to them, well, that's not what scholarship reveals, um, that kind of blew a lot of people's minds. So that was a key issue. And then the social role of the church. What should the church be doing in modern industrial society? that has a lot of inequalities, has a lot of historical baggage associated with it. Um, these are questions that are still being asked today. So the fundamentalists and the, the modernists were sort of at antipodes. And neo-orthodoxy was kind of a mediating position between the two of them. In a way, it's rejecting what it sees as wrong, or it's criticizing what it sees in wrong in both of them. So, for example, on, on the question of biblical scholarship, the neo-Orthodox would say, look, you fundamentalists, you're taking a very uncritical, naive attitude towards the biblical texts. That's not going to work. But you modernists, you're also going too far with some of your, your ideas, some of your claims. You're, you know going beyond what, what evidence uh, would, would suggest. And this is sort of a battle that's still going on today. Uh, with respect to the social role of the church, they said the church, traditionally, as the community, the Christian community, was involved in taking care of people. It was involved in transforming society. But you're not going to be able to create heaven on earth. The way that some of the you know, liberals and social gospel people seem to think you're going to have problems arising um, in any sort of uh, 
any sort of organization that's trying to, to make things better. Um, you know, an example of this would be, if you think about unions, um, what, you know, what was the purpose of unions originally? Why did people make them? Just because they want, you know, didn't have an Elks club to go to and, you know, it'd be more fun to do that. People that you work with. Actually, I mean, if you work with people, you might not want to see them in your time off. Yeah. Wasn't it like to get like a group of people who like all wanted the same thing so that they had like numbers behind like to get what they wanted? Yeah. Now, why did they do that? What was the situation that they were coming up in terms of uh, like the job, you know, job conditions? Or, yeah. Well, just like job security and like making sure that their rights are being protected. Yeah. I mean, if you look at what it was like for workers in the 18th and 19th centuries in industrial England, America, Germany, France, it's pretty horrific. Um, not just workers, you know, coal miners, um, you know, cowboys, we have this romantic image of, of, of you know, agriculture that really wasn't the case. Um, working sucks in a lot of cases. And if your employer can exploit you, that makes it even worse. And so unions formed. So unions were a good thing originally, weren't they? They, they actually brought about a lot of lasting social changes that helped out people, and, and we received some of the benefits of, of the suffering and toil that they engaged in je, you know, decades and generations ago. Um, are unions always a good thing? Some, some people shaking their head, why not? You know, by, by the 1960s and 70s, they'd gotten connected with organized crime. No, I don't hope nobody thinks organized crime is a good thing, despite the fact that we romanticize, you know, the mafia and other organizations. Um, sometimes unions actually don't, don't protect their members. Sometimes they act like any other organization, and they just sort of take advantage of the people under them, and union bosses become the new factory owners. Um, you got to be careful about this sort of stuff. That's the sort of thing that the neo-orthodox would focus on. They would say, look, any one human institution that you think is going to save the day and is going to fix everything, you got to be very careful about that. The people who, you know, if we talk in terms of the westerns and the white hats and black hats, you guys remember this terminology, the old westerns, you can tell who's a good guy because he wears a white hat and the, the, you know, the bad guy wears a black hat. Well, the neo-orthodox would be saying the white hats and black hats change over time. Guys who start out as a white hat, eventually it becomes gray as they start cutting corners. And they, why do they do this? Well, because and here's where, where it's an a, you know, explicitly Christian thing. A lot of these neo-orthodox talk quite a bit about the effects of original sin this traditional Christian notion that um, you, you can take human beings, and human beings are not bad in and of themselves, but there's some radically screwed up things about us. There's, there's ways in which we're broken to the core, and we're not the way that we ought to be. And so when you put a bunch of human beings together in an organization, that organization is not going to make them somehow better than they are, and this is going to have some effects. Um, your book talks about some of the the really key um, thinkers involved in this. And one of them, his name is Karl Barth. Still very highly regarded today, he was a um, Swiss German uh, writer uh, in the Reformed tradition, and he wrote this, this uh, set of books called Church Dogmatics. He also wrote a lot of other stuff too, including a book on, on a guy who I particularly like. Anselm of Canterbury. Um, so this guy had an incredible range. And Bart was reacting against the modernism and liberalism of his time. He, um, he said New Testament scholarship was like going too far. Um, how many of you have heard of Albert Schweitzer before? Anybody? Or is that, that that's sort of a, an empty name to you now? This was a couple generations ago people had heard of him. Schweitzer uh, was known for being a great humanitarian. But he also wrote a book about the quest for the historical Jesus. 
And what he was doing was what we call historiography. Um, are any of you history majors in here? No? Um, his history and historiography are two connected but different things. <coughs> historiography is the history of history. So people write history books, right? And over time, yeah. Yeah, my, uh, my manhood teacher was a history professor, and she made us do a historiography about uh, uh, men's studies. Okay. But the problem is men's studies is so new. Um, yeah, it's She tough wanted to us do. to read book reviews and ask how historians uh, interpret some of the works we read. Yeah, and, um, that's historiography. Yeah, it's way too new. <laughs> yeah, it, it's tough to do with things that are, that, where you've only got a few decades to work with. It's, it's easy to do like the historiography of ancient historians because there's plenty of them out there and you can see what's going on over time. But in any case, what Schweitzer was doing is he's looking at all these people that are writing books about Jesus. And in the 19th century, there'd been quite a few. And interestingly, they, these books didn't all say the same thing. They would, they would take off from the biblical texts and then if they found new texts, they would, they would incorporate those. And they would say, well, you know, this guy Jesus, the Christians have actually misunderstood him. He was actually a, like a you know, liberal social gospel kind of guy. And Schweitzer said, um, it's sort of like everyone's looking down a well trying to find Jesus at the bottom. The trouble is, when you look down a well, what are you actually going to see in the water? If you see anything. Reflection. Of? Yourself. Exactly. So all these people are looking down the years, and the Jesus that they're seeing is the Jesus that they want to see, who you know ends up being kind of a you know bourgeois, uh, nice guy Jesus. And so Bart says, you know, if you actually take the gospel seriously, that's not what you're going to get if you're not projecting your own desires onto it, and you're letting the, the gospel sort of speak to you. Then um, you're going to get a really weird Jesus. A Jesus who conflicts with what it is that you would like to see down there. And then you have a choice you have to make. Are you going to follow your own desires, or are you going to actually go with the, the uh, revelation that, that's there? Um, and Bart himself is taking off, and your book talks about some of the people that really influenced him, like St. Augustine, uh, Luther, Calvin, but also this guy, Søren Kierkegaard, who's a Danish uh, a theologian and philosopher, somebody else who I particularly like as well. And Bart gives rise to this whole movement of what's called dialectical uh, theology. Um, a lot of that's coming out of Kierkegaard. Uh, sometimes you'll hear this talked about in terms of existentialism, existentialist theology. So um, Bart's not the only guy who's doing this. There's another guy in the scene later on, Paul Tillich. Um, who is, is uh, here in the States, I should probably put his name down, Paul Tillich. Um, as a matter of fact, if, if, you, if, you, if you take an existentialism class, you might actually read Paul Tillich's book, The Courage to Be. Um, Tillich was a major American theologian as well. He was a bit more liberal than, than Bart was. Somebody else, or rather two guys who are very important and really fit into this neo-orthodoxy thing would be the uh, Niebuhr. I'm having trouble spelling today. The Niebuhr brothers, um, Reinhold and Richard. And Richard is more of a church historian. He wrote a particularly good book called The Kingdom of God in America about the Puritans. Um, Reinhold is more of the heavy hitter theologian, social uh, social theorist, and he's still highly regarded <coughs> today. The book that you might have read by him, if you've ever read anything by him, would be Moral Man and Immoral Society. Uh, it's a very easy read and well worth worth uh, looking at. And um, Reinhold Niebuhr, like he said, the book says, begins his career as a pastor in in Detroit. And in Detroit, he had a chance to see the inequities of the social order in race and labor relations. And he saw how Christians are trying to, to deal with this sort of stuff. Um, he eventually you know, starts moving upstairs, so to speak, in the hierarchy of education. And then he becomes um, nationally prominent as an applied ethicist. And he levels this profound criticism of American institutions from the social gospel 
uh, you know, to, to all sorts of other things. And he, he's saying things like, it's, you know, you don't want to say you shouldn't have an economy, and you, you don't want to say you shouldn't have politics, but don't pretend like the kingdom of God is actually going to be realized here on earth through some political platform. Uh, and if you are actually trying to make claims like that, you're probably engaging in idolatry. Um, and, and so, you know, fundamentalists could say, yeah, I think you're right about that sort of stuff, but they, they wouldn't go along with him on other things. Modernists and, and theological liberals who are often very prone to read into their, their social crusades a kind of eschatological significance also couldn't go along with that either. He was criticizing them. He ends up actually um, becoming um, pretty important in American politics, influencing people like John Kennedy. So uh, now neo-orthodoxy ends up sort of vanishing from the scene after a while. It gets supplanted by some more uh, radical um, theologies in the 60s and 70s. But it, it came back to a certain extent in the 80s, 90s, and it's kind of the background of a lot of contemporary theological writing, a lot of contemporary theological thinking. So it's good to know about. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is ecumenicism. So what does this term ecumenicism what does that mean? If you're ecumenical, is there something wrong with you? Maybe you got a disease you can take a pill for? So ecumenical. Or is it a good thing? Why can't you be ecumenical like your brother? It's not really either one of those sort of things. It has to do with, with how you relate to... Um, let's, let's put it in terms of inter-religious. Two things, really. Dialogue and community. This is a, you know, a, a key issue that's faced <coughs> by uh, anybody who belongs to um, a community that has some very strong beliefs, that has a history, that has tradition behind it, and that's differentiated from other communities. And it doesn't just have to be a religious issue. It could be in terms of politics. It could be in terms of your, your views on academia and whether it's worth going to college or not or whether you should you know, go get a, quote, real job out there in the world right away. People have very strongly held views on some things, right? And quite often people stick with people who see things the same way as them. Ecumenicism means broadening your, your horizons so that you actually engage with people who don't see things the way that you do. So let's think in terms of, not, well, let's get away from religion so we can use a different example. Um, everybody here in this classroom, except for me, and at one time I actually fit the bill too, is a pretty traditional college student. You guys are in your... Uh, Late teens, very few of you, or early 20s. Um, you have some sort of career track in mind, I think. All of you plan on working after this, I, I, I hope. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be a good job for you out there that will suit your heart's desire, but, but at least you're, you're set to, to do things like that. Um, what would be the... What would be somebody else's life position which would be radically different than yours? where not only would they have different desires and a different set of plans, different outlooks, different expectations, um, but they would also, like you, you guys spend a lot of time with other college students, don't you? By, you know, whether you like it or not, you have to. You're in class with them, you live in a community with them, um, you have to interact with them. You think of yourself as a college student. What would be another example for somebody who would be, tw let's say, 22 years old, where they would be in that kind of circumstance, living with a lot of other people who are doing the same thing as them, seeing the world the same way, that's radically different from your own current lifestyle? 
What comes to mind? Yeah. Like someone who's in the military? That's the first thing I thought about, too. Now, of course, you know, ROTC students that would be, you know, kind of living in two different worlds, which sometimes makes it tough, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, if you're over in Afghanistan and you're, you know, hanging out with the, the people in your squad, your platoon, your company, um, you may not even know the people in your battalion because, you know, you just never see them. Um, and you're doing that day in, day out. That's a very different kind of life experience than what we have here, isn't it? Would you have anything in common with them? Other than being Americans or, you know, maybe popular culture. Did you catch the show last night? You know, you like the, what do you like for the, the Super Bowl? Would you, what about life stuff? Imagine you were going to write a letter to them. Or email. It would be a lot easier to email, right? Who writes letters these days? Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're going to email. You're going to do one of these email a soldier program. What would you actually say to them? How would you connect with them? How was your day? And they say, well, uh, roadside bomb today. And I think I may have killed somebody, but I'm not sure because I was shooting at them and they were about 400 yards away. And I'm not sure how I feel about it. I say, Ooh. Yeah, my day was like that too. I took a test. And man, was that test hard. Or is it impossible to relate to people in these kind of circumstances? Yeah. Well, I mean, like in both situations, like there's like a goal in mind. Like, okay. Is that goal? So notice what you're doing there. You're looking for commonalities that, that bridge over the differences. And you're not saying the differences don't matter. That would be the, the sort of snarky thing that I was doing, you know. I know exactly how you feel. Well, a lot of times we have no idea how other people feel. But that doesn't mean that we can't engage in dialogue with them. Now let's go back to the realm of, of religion. <clears throat> Imagine that you're a, a Catholic. You grew up Catholic. And um, you didn't grow up in the very multicultural society that we have. Let's say you grew up in, in the sort of Catholicism of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, which has been described as here comes everyone. Uh, meaning that everybody you know in your neighborhood is a Catholic because you probably live in a, you know, Catholic area in, in the city that you're in. Um, and maybe you go to Catholic school. Odds are if your parents have enough money or the priest is active enough in your parish, you probably go to Catholic school. You don't go to public school. <coughs> and now you go out into the workforce and you start interacting with people and one of them is a Baptist and one of them is a Jew and one of them is a Pentecostal. And you start realizing, wow, people don't all take this for granted. And when I, you know, um, this isn't something that most people do these days, but when I make the sign of the cross before I say grace before meals, everyone looks at me funny. Like I'm doing something wrong. Um, or weird. Now you're in a situation that could call for ecumenicism. And what was going on in America in the uh, 20th century was a, a lot more and more of ecumenicism. As your book says, it, be, it begins really, the ecumenical movement begins within the Protestant community. Why the Protestant community? Why would that be the, the place? Yeah. Because they have to appeal to a lot of different denominations. So. Yeah, I mean, if, by the time that we're talking about the early 20th century, the Protestant Reformation is splintered into, you know, hundreds of, of different approaches to what it means to be a Protestant Christian. And sometimes they've actually, you know, fought, not here in America so much, but in other places, fought wars about it. So, you know, some of them take, take these things pretty seriously. And they begin to start, you know, comparing and contrasting and seeing whether they can overcome some of these divides. Um, and your book talks about a number of different examples of this. Um, the Unitarians and Universalists come together in one church. Um, the Congregationalists uh, become more and more liberal over the years. They unite with the Christian churches. Uh, the United Church of Christ forms out of the ecumenical movement. Methodists and Presbyterians um, at one time were divided you know, into north and south because of slavery. The Civil War had broke them apart. The churches come back together. Um, it, your book also talks quite a bit about the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is the result of a whole bunch of mergers taking place 
over decades between all these different Lutheran bodies. And that's all coming out of the ecumenical um, movement. Um, there's a number of different uh, councils of churches that, that come about, the Federal Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, um, and, and the idea is to try to bring people together without, without trying to erode the differences, without trying to make them all into one thing, to bring them together so that they can all at least talk to each other and perhaps share some sort of community with each other. Um, your book then talks about um, what happens among other, other Christians and indeed other religions outside of the Protestant spectrum. It says, interfaith dialogue among the Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and mainline Protestants are now, is now a commonplace of American uh, religious life. And it says, fundamentalists and some evangelicals keep their distance. Evangelicals have actually, in recent years, there's an Evangelicals and Catholics Together movement that, that publishes things every once in a while. They got together and they talked about their differences about, say, Mary in, in recent years. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion along these lines that, that's occurring. Um, there have been some attempts to try to leverage this into actually producing some sort of community. So your book gives the example of the churches uniting, how is it? Uh, yeah, churches uniting in Christ. Um, <coughs> which used to be the Consultation on Church Union. That's what I was thinking, called crew. And the idea was to actually bring all these churches together. These sort of things usually don't get a lot of traction because um, this is something interesting to think about. Why do people go to the churches that they do? I mean, America is sort of like a huge marketplace. If you decided that you weren't getting what you wanted out of the church that you're currently going to, you could go to another church, right? Just look in the yellow pages online, you know, or um, if you go to a hotel, you can, you know, usually better hotels will have a listing of all the local religious bodies so that people can go to them. Um, why do people go to the particular churches that they go to? This is a question a lot of people don't think about. Yeah. Um, they like how it's run or what it stands for. Okay, now notice those can be two very different things. Because you could actually love what your church stands for and, and be like, man, the people running it, they have no idea what they're doing. I, I, you know, I go for the liturgy, but I can't stand these, these you know, people in charge. Uh, or it could be the other way around. I don't really like the liturgy, but I kind of like these people that are running the show. You know, they seem to have good, you know, Good things in mind. So there's two things right there, two considerations. Um, those are probably good reasons to go to a church. Uh, what are other reasons people go? Yeah. Because their parents make them. Yeah, and sometimes they'll be like, well, uh, look, our family's always going to this church. Not, and it may not even be just the denomination. You know, there could be like two, two churches of the same denomination within driving distance. We're not going to that church because our family's never gone to that church. It's got to be this church over here. And you're like, come on, they're, they're both in the same denomination. It's not supposed to make any difference. But people have these kind of emotional attachments to that. Um, people go to churches because they have some sort of intrinsically valuable reason at some level to go to that church, to belong to that group, to continue in that tradition. Otherwise, they'll, they'll find another one. If you try to bring them all together into one huge umbrella and say, well, we're all on the same page, what do you think the effect of that sometimes is? People start being interested. They start saying, what's the point? We lost what's distinctive to us. Let me ask you, and this will sound like a very silly, trivial question, but I notice a lot of you have, have Marist spirit gear. Um, do you have any sort of emotional attachment to that? What if Marist decided uh, everyone's going to have to turn in, you know, you have to turn in that shirt and you know the swimming shirt too, uh, you know, and we're going to give you a blue and yellow one instead. 
Would you be like, yeah, it sounds fine to me. Colors are just colors. Or would that bother you on some level? Even though you know it's totally irrational, would that bother you? Bother me? I don't, I don't even go here. I just teach here. It would, would it bother you? What if they said, um, we're not going to do the fox anymore. We're now going to be the warthog. <laughs> or the, the pale. Or the, you know, there's a lot more, there's very few foxes around here. We're going to use markers <laughs> from now on. Yeah, it'll just be a marker. And uh, we'll let it have a tail, you know, just to keep some continuity. <laughs> the fighting markers. Uh, will that bother you? Is it just because it's silly that it would bother you, or do you have an emotional attachment? You want something that's distinctive. Yeah. I have a friend that goes to a school in central Pennsylvania, and they've always been like the Crusaders. Oh, they're, yeah. Where they're like athletic thing. And then that, they never like had an actual mascot recently, though, just because I guess that was a little like. It's tough to make a mascot for a Crusaders. Yeah. So they didn't really have it. So then they had like a tiger at their games. Okay. Even not the tigers. But then they just changed it, and I guess since they have a lot of squirrels on their campus, they're now like, they're still the Crusaders, but they're going to have squirrel at their games. How's that going? Everyone there is really like annoyed just because it kind of just makes them look stupid. So you know, this is this is about sports stuff, right? Yeah. Which which really in the big picture is kind of trivial stuff. Now extended to religion, where people's emotions and long-standing commitments are even more involved. Um, if you try to erode religious differences, um, sometimes that drives people away. And, and that's what brings us to talk now about mainline Protestantism.